Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so uh, today's program is called Drop in Groups at the University Counseling Centers What Works. And now uh, this is put on by AGPA, College Counseling and Other Educational Settings, uh, SIG. My name is Ksenia Zhuzha. Uh, I use she, her, hers pronouns. So I will be serving as a moderator for today's panel. I'm a psychologist at the University of Nevada, Reno Counseling Services, and I'm also the education chair of IGPA College Counseling SIG. Um, I'm connecting to you today from Reno, Nevada, which is the traditional territory of the Basha Nation. So we're joined today by our wonderful third presenters, Dr. Ellie Jin. Uh, she is an integrated health counselor at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Wendy gonzalez Canal. Uh, and she's a psychologist and group coordinator at Pace University in New York. And Dr. Ben DeBoer, um, who is certified group psychotherapist and psychologist and group coordinator um, at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. So it's an honor to have you all in our program today. Welcome. So before we begin, and I let our panelists to take the reins, I would like to give a brief overview of the Zoom and how we'll be using that today. All right, so automatic captioning is enabled for this event. So you can usually turn it on and off by selecting called closed captions icon on the navigation panel at the bottom of your screen. I've enabled live captioning, so you should be seeing it now. So your microphones will be muted um, throughout the presentation as they are right now. And this is just to eliminate the background noise, which can be disruptive. If you are seeing myself and our three panelists in the center of your screen, you are in speaker view. So it is the recommended setting for this webinar. However, you uh, also have the option to switch to gallery, to gallery view, which will allow you to see more participants on one screen. And you can switch between the views at your discretion by clicking speaker view or gallery view. Uh, those are often located on, uh, in the upper right corner of your screen. This webinar is being recorded once it's uploaded on YouTube, which will take about one to two weeks after today. Um, all of you will receive an email with the link recording. Um, and a few words about how our today's program is structured. So for the first hour, panelists will talk about the drop-in programs at their counseling centers and answer questions I've prepared for them. And then last 20 to 30 minutes, uh, the event will be devoted to questions from the audience, so yourselves. Uh, so please hold your questions until then. To ask a question during the Q&A portion, simply unmute your microphone. Um, also, there will be some people who will be trickling in late. And I will be sending chat instructions, repeating kind of the, uh, the format of this presentation and some guidelines. So those may be popping into your chat from time to time. Um, so that is just to reiterate what we're doing here so, now, so everybody kind of feels on the same page. Also, we will have a brief feedback survey at the end. Uh, it's super short. I know that some people may not be staying for the whole program and leaving after an hour. So I will be sending it, that in the chat uh, before the first hour ends. All right, so with that, uh, I will turn over to Ellie to begin our discussion panel, uh, discussion panel and tell us, uh, tell us, Ellie, about drop-in program uh, at UT Austin. Thank you so much for bringing us together, Ksenia, and also for the introduction. I really appreciate being here with all y'all. Um, my name is Ellie Jin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a psychologist at University of Texas at Austin. And I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. Moreover, I would like to acknowledge the Alabama, Cushata, uh, Caddo, Carrizo, um, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipan, Apache, Tokawa, and all the native Indian indigenous people and communities who have been or have been part of these lands and territories in Texas where I reside. So some just background context. Um, as a psychologist at UT Austin, we serve um, about 51,000 students uh, yearly. 
uh, well, I would say that's our student population. The percentage of that attend counseling services is obviously smaller. And um, in terms of the discussion groups that we offer this semester, we have uh, various uh, groups that center around identities. So currently we offer Asian Voices, uh, Black Boy Joy, Women of Color Discussion Group, uh, Free to Be ND, which is a group for uh, neurodiverse students, Queer Voices, and Trans and Non-Binary Voices, which is a group that I led for two semesters. And uh, I will primarily be discussing my experiences facilitating the trans and non-binary group as a cisgender woman. Um, so just some additional information that may be helpful for this group. Um, it was led for about an hour and a half each during the semester um, for the spring and uh, summer of 2021. Um, you may be curious about, you know, who was co-leading the, the space with me. So for spring 2021, I co-led the group with a non-clinical staff member uh, from the Gender and Sexuality Center. Uh, this felt like a pretty important collaboration just because uh, the Gender and Sexuality Center is a really key partner in many of our outreach efforts. And having um, a staff member from the GSC really helped to legitimize our group uh, with this being a newly minted space. This was uh, a group that was created after uh, one of our really beloved trans providers uh, departed from our agency. And uh, during the most recent semester in summer 2021, I co-led the group with a trans identify psychology intern. And because of uh, Zoom, um, because of COVID restrictions, we had the group uh, via Zoom for both the spring and summer sessions. Um, I'll pause there for a second, uh, Xenia, just to see if we wanted to just save some of the other pieces for, for later, but I'm happy to talk more about um, both the uh, structure, marketing, as well as other information that may be helpful for, for folks to know who are interested in running a similar group. Yeah, thanks, Ellie. Uh, we'll leave the marketing for later. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, if you can speak maybe a little bit how students access the group, uh, if they're like referred um, by, by clinician or if they sign up themselves, like what uh, the, uh, that looks like for you. Yeah. So for the group, uh, we had students uh, sign up directly on the group's website via a Zoom registration link. And the students found this really accessible because um, you know, they can sign up anytime in the semester and drop in for one session or a series of sessions throughout the rest of the semester. They were automatically um, given the Zoom link uh, to log in. And so um, they can access that from anywhere, any device that they had access to. And uh, how many students uh, on average attended the group? Uh, that really ranged uh, because the, the trans non population is relatively small. We had between one to five students, depending on the group. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ellie. We'll, I'll ask you more questions as we go on. Uh, so curious about so many things. But Wendy, why don't you tell us about uh, groups, drop-in groups at your center before we go into questions for everybody? Yes. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Wendy Gonzalez-Canal. I am a group coordinator and staff psychologist at Pace University's uh, New York City Counseling Center. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Pace, we actually have two campuses. Um, so I am at the New York City campus. So I'll be essentially giving like a little bit of information about that. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the traditional territory of the Muncie Lenape, um, both in New York City and where I live in uh, Jersey City. Um, so Pace is a relatively small university. So there's 13,000 students altogether, but only about 8,000 of those are in New York City. So um, we have two campuses and two counseling centers. Um, and we collaborate, um, but they're separate. So students who attend the Westchester or the law school um, cannot seek services um, at our center. And that's important because it really restricts the number of students that we can see. Um, we offer at the New York City um, Counseling Center um, one main drop-in group and then workshops as well. And that's something that um, I started last year. So our the drop-in group I'll be focusing on for the sake of this presentation is our stress management group, which is um, ACT-based. Um, it's a group that was created 
at the center way before my time. I started here about a year ago. Um, so it's been going for about eight years. Um, and it, it has like shifted essentially by um, depending on who um, who the group coordinator is. But um, we I recently also developed or working on developing some DBT informed workshops, which are two session longs. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. Um, the stress management group is a six week uh, structured group. Um, so there are six different topics, the control agenda, diffusion, acceptance, present moment, values, and committed action. Um, and the group runs, so the six sort of lectures run twice a semester. Um, it is um, the leaders of the group are our externs. Um, so we have four extern trainees who I supervise and train on providing the group. Um, and so two of them lead it in the fall. They do both um, times in the fall and then the other two lead it in the spring. Um, currently it's a virtual group. All of our groups have been virtual for the last year and will continue to be virtual this fall. Um, it, it's interesting because it's a group that has had some inconsistent attendance in the past. Um, and some, there were times when, you know, the group had to be canceled because nobody attended. However, since we've gone fully virtual, despite us having a, you know, lower number of students um, seeking services, there was always at least one or two students um, in the group. Um, and let's see. Uh, the students have to be a member or a client of the center, so they have to be referred internally. Um, if they call in and they're interested, we say, okay, you have to do a screening um, with, with our center. Um, it's a very manualized group, so the trainees, for the sake of their training and consistency, um, there's an outline of what they need to discuss. Um, and yeah, anything else you want me to share, Ksenia? Uh, that is, I think that hit most of the points. Um, yeah, um, we'll ask more questions of you, Wendy, as when we move to questions. Uh, ben, uh, tell us about the program at uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine. Thank you, Ksenia, and nice to be with you all this morning. So my name is Ben DeBoer. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, and I'm here in Madison, Wisconsin. And the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I work occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, uh, a place that the Ho-Chunk nation has called Dejop since time immemorial. Uh, so the university has um, a little more than 45,000 students. Uh, that's undergrad, grad, and also professional uh, students as well. So, and we serve uh, the full scope um, of the student population. We have seven drop-in groups that we're offering this semester at our center. Uh, so those are a drop-in eating concern support group, a drop-in survivor support group for survivors of sexual assault, uh, dating violence, interpersonal violence. Uh, we have a grad resilience drop-in group, um, something that's called Let's Face It, face it, the word face is it's just an acronym for foster acceptance and cope effectively. Uh, that is an act-based um, group that students can attend. It's two sessions um, that will be repeating so that other students can participate as the semester progresses. Uh, we have a meditation drop-in group. We also have something called mindfulness sampler uh, where there are specific uh, topics that are covered, mindfulness of body one week, mindfulness of emotions one week, one, mindfulness of um, thoughts another week, and so on. Uh, so people can get a feel for, for that. And then we also have something called the Student Success Series. And there are three uh, distinct uh, topics or, or focus areas that are covered in this drop-in group, test anxiety, um, focusing uh, attention and concentration, and then lastly, something that covers uh, time management. So I'm going to be, um, for the purpose of our presentation today, talking about the student success series. Um, and it's something that we launched in fall 2017. It was our first sort of uh, option for students to sign up uh, without having any uh, previous contact with our counseling center. It could be accessible to any student um, 
even if they're not, you know, coming in for an intake or wanting any other mental health services. Um, so we made it very accessible. Um, and so the idea is that this um, series would cover uh, test anxiety, time management, and concentration because these are, you know, academic concerns that might cut across a ver you know, various um, presenting issues that students may you know, face um, that impacts their performance and functioning as a student. Um, so we also felt that uh, these concerns would likely be impacting students who wouldn't otherwise come in for traditional counseling. Uh, so it could meet a, a need that's out there. We offer uh, each of these um, five times per semester and they are one hour in length. And so we rotate. So this past week was the time management um, series uh, one, which was called Make the Most of Your Time. We thought, oh, with the start of the semester, this is a good opportunity to begin to provide this service so that students can practice and, and learn some time management skills at the outset um, before things get really busy and overwhelming for them. Uh, the leader of this uh, group is a staff psychologist and they are paired with a co-facilitator that is a practicum trainee. Um, and we have seven practicum trainees this fall and they will be rotating in and taking turns um, facilitating, co-facilitating these groups. And so they get some experience in, in practice doing that. Uh, the group is held online via Zoom. And this allows for, you know, uh, obviously during COVID ease of access. And we're probably going to continue even once those um, you know, restrictions are lifted we're likely going to continue to offer this um, type of group online um, because it allows us to reach a larger number of students um, and those who aren't even based within the city. They can, you know, be um, kind of joining from anywhere, which I think is, is valuable for us. Um, students access this group by... Uh, just logging in, uh, they have to sign up uh, on a Qualtrics survey that is listed on our website. And they have to enter in um, that they have a Wisconsin, UW, you know, Madison email address so that we know they're affiliated with the university. Um, and then they have to read a, uh, a document that stipulate some of the ground rules of participation, and then they're given the Zoom link uh, to, to join. The group structure uh, is kind of a hybrid format. It incorporates didactic kind of psychoeducational instruction uh, to help them kind of gain some of the skills. And then there's also time for discussion and some activities uh, to put things into practice. And there is a wide range, as you might expect, with drop-in groups uh, of how many students will attend. Um, it really does vary week to week. Uh, last semester in the spring, we averaged three students uh, per group. And the range was from zero. Sometimes there, was, there were no attendees. And then we had up to six uh, for this particular group um, in a couple of the weeks. So it, it does vary. I think that's all I've got for now. I'm looking forward to your questions. Yes, thank you, Ben. So uh, this question is for everybody. And Ellie, maybe I would like you to start. Um, what led you to make this a drop-in group versus a traditional uh, closed group? Like, what are the benefits? What led to this decision? Yeah, thank you for that question, Xenia. Um, I think for us, it felt really important to have a drop-in group versus a more traditional closed group because we wanted to really increase accessibility for our students. This group came together at a time immediately following the departure of one of our uh, transit infant clinicians, as I mentioned. 
And uh, when he led the group, he had two uh, closed sections uh, during his tenure here. And we wanted to be thoughtful of the needs of students who, you know, for example, is balancing part-time work along with classes and who might be actually um, in earlier stages of identity exploration and wanted to check us out um, in this uh, trans non-binary space without a longer term commitment. And um, the, the second part of that was really based on a piece of feedback we had gathered from our partners at the Gender and Sexuality Center. Um, they had identified that students were really wanting a space where they could be maybe in the questioning stage of our, their identity and um, you know, meet other people who are um, also there with them or maybe further along in their identity development. And so the drop-in group, I think, really facilitated that versus a closed group um, where students might feel intimidated if they had to be there throughout the semester. Uh, we were also really thoughtful about the level of risk that might be presenting in a closed uh, therapy group versus a drop-in group. And just based on where we are in the semester, uh, we want it made more sense to have a drop-in group so that it did not really dive uh, too deeply into suicidality, um, just because we could meet the needs of many students more effectively. So those are some of the considerations we had for uh, having a drop-in space versus a traditional closed group. Ellie, as you, as you were talking about this, uh, uh, a question came up, came to me that I have not thought of before. Um, how do you see many of the students who come to your drop-in group then seeking services at your center? Does that happen often? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. That's actually been one of the, you know, the, the joys of uh, facilitating the trans non-binary group. Uh, it became kind of an introduction to counseling services as well as our university health services. Uh, we have a gender uh, care clinic. And so students learn about counseling as well as medical um, you know, HRT, hormone uh, replacement therapy, for example, through the group as they hear the experiences of other students. And so um, for many people, it's their first introduction to therapy altogether. Awesome. Uh, so Ben, uh, I'm curious to hear more from you. I know you already spoken a little bit about reasons. You've said that mm -hmm. you know, because academic concerns are pretty common for students, you know, especially right now switching modalities. And it uh, sounds like some of the students may be out of the area, um, mm -hmm. so drop-in groups help. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, curious, you know, if you can speak about this specific uh, group, I think you call it academic success, a success series, right? Yeah, the student success series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but I also heard that you have a lot of groups at your center, yeah. and I'm curious, you know, how, like what led you all to uh, offer so many drop-in groups? Yeah, uh, so, you know, really the consideration, um, I think, primarily comes from knowing that our closed groups are going to fill with up to eight students, and then there, you know, wouldn't be anything remaining, potentially, for students who present to us later in the semester. So the model of a closed group in our center really privileges students who come and present early in the semester, you know, in early September, they get into the groups and, you know, that's a timing a benefit that they have. But we also know that a lot of the students um, aren't going to come right away at the beginning of the semester and, and may not be as proactive or may not be experiencing the concern um, just yet. So having these uh, drop-in groups available uh, throughout the semester and that we'll kind of have either repeating um, a series or just continuously open uh, allows to, um, you know, welcome more people into, into groups. And, and we, we really value that. And we wanna remain accessible to students throughout the semester. Another neat thing about the drop-in groups, there's no screenings that are required. Um, so this really is one less hurdle or barrier for our students, um, they don't have to have an intake um, and, and they can just choose to do this and not any other service through our, our center. Um, and I think for the student success series, another, and in some of the other uh, drop-ins that we have are also co-led by trainees. And so we see this as a, a valuable training experience for them. Uh, so it doubles as, as that to, um, so that, those are the, the primary reasons. And I'm curious, um, 
how much uh, students just sign up for these groups online and how much uh, of the students who attend are referred by staff? Mm -hmm. Students yeah. Heard, yeah, go ahead. A, a, fa a fairly, um, you know, high number of students that will attend are being referred by staff or um, they have heard it from a care provider in medical. So we belong to an integrated kind of health service. So there's um, medical staff, uh, primary care, women's health, immunization, all these different areas. And um, we get referrals or other uh, providers will make recommendations to students to say, hey, this is something that's available. Maybe they're seeing a nutritionist in, in the medical department and the nutritionist refers to the eating concerns uh, drop-in group. Um, so it, it's a nice uh, option to have these available. Um, but also, you know, it's, it's a nice mix because students will just find it on their own uh, without any referral at all. And uh, when, when staff specifically at your center uh, refer to, you know, maybe they're doing individual work with clients and say, like, you know what, actually you'd really benefit from the student success series so that mm -hmm. we use our counseling sessions for other things. Uh, just, I don't know if you have knowledge of this, do students generally follow through on those recommendations? Yeah, so we, you know, it's difficult to see because um, we don't document in a, in a formal manner uh, for the students who will present for these drop-in groups. They are not uh, being tracked in our electronic health um, kind of record or, or chart. Um, I ask the facilitators of the drop-in groups just to gather raw numbers of how many students attended. Uh, I'm not asking for more kind of identifying information. So I don't do any sort of retroactive um, kind of linking to see, oh, was this a client of, of this provider? So we're not tracking that. And that's just another way for us to, to keep this like clinically light and not have it, um, you know, attached to the health record or um, further burden students with having them um, it would be in a formal kind of clinical arrangement. Thank you. Wendy, what about um, the groups at your center? And what led you to make it an open open group, drop-in format? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, this group precedes me. Um, and But I do know the reason it was made <laughs> a drop-in group rather than a closed group. I think it was at a time when the counseling center, as I'm sure we've all experienced, um, they were dealing with a pretty significant uptick in um, students seeking our services. Um, and it was created as a way for students who were seeking our services who maybe we were already full. Um, I think it was created back when we had a wait list. We, we no longer have wait lists. Um, but back then, you know, the clinicians were seeing students long, longer term. This is a primarily psychodynamic, um, psychoanalytic site. Um, so I think when it was created, it was created as a way for, um, you know, the students who are coming in in October and November to have something so that we can say, we have this for you, this meets every week, you can just attend this um, while we get you connected, say with an external referral or what you are waiting for services. So um, it has continued to serve in that capacity. And I think it's something the university as a whole really values as a service that no matter how busy the counseling center is, the student can always um, come in and there's always at least one thing that they can get from our center. Um, I think with their busy schedules and I think you know uh, Ben you were just talking about this being a training opportunity it has always been something that our externs do and they really love it um, they get to learn a lot from this experience um, they the students do have to be a client of the center um, which means the trainees also get the experience of writing the note um, consulting following up with um, any internal referrals. So if these are students who are being seen for individual therapy, I make it part of their training to really highlight, you need to be consulting with, with the individual therapist if the student is not following um, through with the referral. And it's something we discuss in our 
um, staff meeting every Wednesday. So we have a section for uh, group updates. And I say, okay, give an update of what you taught last week, where you're teaching next week. Um, and it serves kind of as a constant reminder to our clinicians. This is a service we have. Make sure you're sending students. Um, and yeah, um, so uh, the I think it, it's, we really encourage students to come to as many as possible, even though it's a drop-in group because they do build on one another um, to a certain extent and that they can come as many times as they want. Um, but, but yeah, so it's that kind of that middle ground between open and, and close. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, Wendy, since you have the spotlight, uh, how uh, you already talking about like that uh, staff, uh, you encouraging staff a lot to report to this group. What other marketing have you done for the, this drop-in group? Yeah, so um, I, like I mentioned, I'm relatively new. I just started last year, so I have been really working on establishing these connections with um, other places on campus. So I've really been focusing with um, RAs and our entire like residential um, team. So I've gone out and I've met RAs, and this year they're going to put it in their sort of like wellness board. So the students are going to add it to that. So anytime there is an email request of, hey, do you want us to include anything in our marketing and make sure to be very responsive to that. Um, we So I develop flyers. I'm not the most, um, I don't know, artistic person, but I give it a shot. So we've got flyers. <laughs> um, and so um, those flyers go out electronically and also I send them out to um, people to print out and put in the departments um, virtually because everything has been virtual over the last year. We have uh, TV screens on campus that rotate through different ads. So I submit to that. Um, we have an online portal where students can check in and see what all the clubs are doing. So that's called um, Set or Sync. And in Set or Sync, there's always um, flyers for the groups that we're running. Um, and then we have something called the Pulse, which is an email that goes out to all students on Mondays. And in the Pulse at the beginning of the semester, I make sure to send in um, also the flyer and the list of groups that we're running. I'm going to try to create this semester a longer lasting relationship with that and seeing if we can spotlight it every week. Um, but we tend to get a big um, response from that one. I usually get a couple of emails from the students. Um, our, our staff, most of our staff, um, the email, our email address isn't on the website, but mine is. So I make it very accessible. And I say, if you have any questions, if you're interested, please don't hesitate and reach out. Um, so I try to do that um, as well. And I've volunteered to do a lot of the welcome week things. And I put my face out there and I say, hi, I work at the counseling center. You have any questions about group? Um, and try to um, kind of create some buzz around that there. Sounds like you're doing quite a bit of outreach. Yes, yes. Um, my director may or may not have called me a group coordinator on steroids the other day uh, because I tried to do uh, a lot. <laughs> I hope you're taking care of yourself too in the midst of all of that. <laughs> I am, I am. I'm an extrovert, so this kind of stuff also really energizes me. Well, that's good. Um, Ellie, what about at your center? How do y'all um, market uh, your drop-in groups and specifically uh, the group you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. All the groups are updated every semester on our group's website, and students uh, will directly refer to that when they're signing up for, for groups uh, through our triaging team. Um, I specifically marketed the trans and non binary group by sharing a digital flyer with all of our clinicians on our internal listserv and also various campus groups that were relevant. Uh, so, this included the Gender Sexuality Center, that included the digital flyer in their weekly newsletter. Um, I also advertise with the um, Women and Gender Studies Department, um, various LGBTQIA student and faculty associations, um, and also Discord channels um, that, you know, had uh, many students um, connected to it, especially because we were all um, onboarding in a virtual setting uh, for many people. Uh, we also had published the information via our student health network social media, so that included uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, and um, when, you know, some of the legislative uh, stuff that was happening in Texas that were, um, you know, targeting uh, trans-identified individuals, 
Um, I also made sure that we connected with Austin wide or Texas Y organizations such as Out Youth and Algo, which is the Austin based organization for um, queer trans folks of color. Um, just, just because it felt important to make sure that the information is out there for people that maybe had fewer resources. So, so yeah, we definitely advertise widely, both on campus as well as off campus to make sure that um, people were aware of our group. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, who does the advertising? Is it uh, the role of group leaders or is it the role of group coordinator? How does that work? So I, I, I took charge of connecting to these uh, community uh, campus uh, partners. And um, I trusted that they sent out the stuff that they promised they would on the listservs or in their publications. Um, I did get a lot of help from our, um, I, I guess, a design specialist who um, created uh, our digital flyer uh, so that it was, you know, within the same scheme and palette as our other um, publications online. So that was something that I got some help with. And uh, Ben, what about you? How does marketing work for your center? Yeah, well, it's a team effort. And, um, it, you know, each uh, of our staff have um, a health ambassador relationship so that there's a campus partner that they um, are linked with. And, and that campus partner is a liaison uh, for that department. And uh, we encourage each of our health ambassadors to forward information about our groups at the outset of each semester. Um, and separate from that, I also do more targeted outreach, uh, for instance, for the student success series, um, sending information to those student organizations uh, that may be related to like academic um, advising or tutoring, those kind of areas that might align with the content of that group. And I encourage our other, the facilitators of our other drop-in groups to do the same to kind of look through the campus directory uh, and see are there student organizations or other uh, affiliated um, groups or uh, spaces that might you know, feel that this type of group fits for their needs of their community. Uh, so that, that's generally how we do it. Um, obviously we also publish uh, the updated group schedule on our website. And there's a particular carve out displayed on our group's webpage of all of the groups that are drop in or basically um, eligible for students to just sign up on their own without coming through um, for a screening or an intake. And so we try to make that visible uh, for people who are navigating to the website. Um, largely though, I think many, uh, much of the uh, marketing is internal. Uh, it's communicating with my colleagues, uh, making sure they're aware of the sort of menu of group options each semester because we have so many uh, that we are offering. We really wanted to get on our staff's radar what we have so that they can make uh, referrals to their, to their students. Thank you, Ben. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about other topics. Uh, heads up, my Zoom interface is messing up and I somehow have lost access to chat function and participants function, uh, the joys of technology. <laughs> uh, can you all still hear me and see this, the captions? Yes, okay. Yes. Um, if I can ask panelists, um, if I can, if when you're not speaking, if you're able to kind of monitor if anybody new comes in, I would really appreciate you letting them in from the waiting room. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to resolve itself. If it doesn't before q and I may need to pop out of the uh, Zoom and come back in um, so I can, I can navigate everything. <laughs> so, but uh, next to... Uh, on to the next question. Uh, this one is for Ben and Wendy, and then maybe you can start. Um, how do you differentiate between drop-in groups and workshops? Because what you're describing, especially with success, uh, student success series, sound like mm -hmm. that workshop. So how do you define those two for your center? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is a tough one. It, sometimes it's a difficult distinction. I think for us at our center, um, these are kind of under the same umbrella in that 
we generally call like our content or activity-based drop-in groups workshops. So there's more um, maybe psychoeducational or didactic components um, and marketing them as workshops to students seems to work for us. Um, the word workshop may be perceived as less intimidating than a group does um, because when we bring up groups to students, it's often met with some you know, anxiety, apprehension, uh, worry about what that would look like and feel like. Um, so particularly with these being that they're often, you know, students will just go to one or two just to get a feel for it. A workshop seems like it reduces some of those anxieties. Um, however, you know, the, let's say eating concern support group or the survivor support group, uh, drop-in support group, we don't refer to those as workshops internally or externally because they aren't as content heavy. Uh, there certainly is uh, information shared um, and activities that are involved, but it is largely more experiential and discussion based. So it's a kind of a blurry distinction, but I guess if it's more psychoeducationally oriented, that's when we would refer to uh, a group as a workshop. Thank you, Ben. Wendy, what about you? Um, how do you differentiate? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, this was created before me and the rule that it needed to be students of the center, um, I think came up because it was in response to a higher demand in the center rather than kind of anticipating the needs of the students. Right, like it was more reactive rather than a proactive approach. So, so it is a a, a group, um, which means the students have to be um, clients of the center, and um, we write notes, um, and the notes go on their file. Um, but they only get a note if they actually attended, right? So, like it's not like they all get at it and get like not attended if they didn't. Um, However, um, I, in the spring semester with um, some of our externs, we develop a DBT informed workshop, um, which has now turned into kind of an added piece of their training. So they'll be developing one every semester, a different pair of externs. Um, and that um, is a two session workshop. And we're calling it workshop because the students don't need to be um, clients at the center um, and I mentioned we have two counseling centers, so this is a place where um, it's um, now it's going to be offered to everybody. So in the spring, we made it so the students did have to be clients, and I got a couple of I don't have the time to also do a screening, you know. And so I kind of saw how um, it was adding a barrier to the students. So this fall semester, um, we're offering two of those: so one in the middle of the semester and one at the end of the semester when we have seen um, spikes in attendance to our um, stress management group. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming it's around midterms and around finals when students start to really um, kind of freak out and want an added, um, added something um, and they come to the center for it. Um, so, so, so that's my distinction. I call it a workshop when I, when it's, similar bent to what you were saying, right? Like it's a lot more didactic. There's less expectation that they're going to share back, which is a lot of what we do with the ACT group as well, the stress management group, um, but these are shorter um, and we wanna make sure that they are provided to um, the entire campus. Um, so that's our Berkey water. Um, and we went a lot of, we went back and forth whether to call it a group or a workshop and thought that um, students would be more likely to come if it was a workshop rather than a group. Yeah, similar to what Ben was saying. So it sounds like, yeah, to some extent, this is mur murky waters and it's the center, like what center decides how to define um, each format and what, what umbrella to put it under. Okay. Um, Wendy, I have another question for you, uh, switching gears a little bit back to what you were saying earlier that, uh, you know, for your group, you encourage students to attend um, all sessions in the series, but it is drop in. So I'm curious, uh, since they build on each other, so how do you handle if a student jumps in in the middle um, of, you know, series or attends only one session? How, how does that work? Yeah, so they... 
they build on each other to a certain extent, right? Like if students have an understanding of what the control agenda is, they'll be, um, it's gonna be easier for them to diffuse from their thoughts, right? And if they have their values well um, established, then they'll be able to take, um, to, co to engage in committed action, um, right? So they do build on each other to an extent. Um, however, students attending that particular group on that particular week, at the end of that group, they will be able to essentially um, take individual knowledge from that, right? So there's always like a takeaway that they can get even if they haven't attended um, the previous ones. So um, our externs at the beginning of each group, um, they, as part of the introduction, they say, okay, so this is week three um, of sex. We're gonna start over again um, on this particular date. Um, we really encourage you to come to as many as you can as they do build on each other. Um, however, we understand your schedule is busy, right? So um, the students are made aware of this and encouraged to attend as many as possible. Um, we have students who attend the entire series and then attend it again, and they really like it. So I have them share that as part of, you know, kind of selling the group. It's like, yeah, we have students who come the entire year. Um, and, um, but I, I think they, they're structured in such a way that even if you don't have the knowledge of the other one, maybe you won't get as much as somebody who does, but you'll still get something um, out of the experience. We have a lot of different, so there's a didactic piece, and then there are um, activities where the students engage and they try out the skill, and then there's some discussion to troubleshoot if that's not working. So part of the training that I do with the externs is also how to work with kind of very quickly, right, um, some resistance. And it's like, well, that's not a problem for me. It's like, all right, you know, great. And like, you know, how do you respond to that when you have an entire group um, that you're managing and leading? So um, that's a long way of answering that. But um, yeah, encouraged, but um, they'll still get something out of it, but they don't have to attend all of them. That sounds like uh, there's a lot of creativity in how to create the um, the curriculum for the group so that it's built on, on sessions built on each other, but also students can come in. So I appreciate that whoever created that sounds amazing to Me be too. able to pull that off. Um, and when did you give a homework as a part of your group and do you check on it given that, you know, some people may not have uh, returned or it's maybe new people in the next session? There is a homework section where we really encourage the students to uh, practice the skills they learn in that particular one. And then at the beginning of the next one, um, that um, the group leaders check in. Anybody have any experience, essentially, um, anybody try out the skills that we went over last week? And we look at that as an opportunity for um, then the new ones to see, oh, so there's other stuff um, that has been talked about. However, uh, from being honest, the majority of the time, they don't do it. <laughs> they don't follow through. We'll have, you know, the one or two really committed students who do, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, but it's not a requirement. It's more like, hey, we encourage you um, to practice this. This is not just going to stick, right, if you do it only during these 45 minutes. But we don't spend a whole lot of time checking in on it because it is drop-in, right? So students can come in and out. Um, and because then it takes away from a lot of the time of the didactic and the activities for the next topic. So if you check in on homework and there's crickets, uh, like is there a role of how group leader handles that? Um, I, yeah, so we talk about that and essentially it's just, um, you know, a couple of seconds go by and nobody's jumping in, then you move on um, okay. and say, okay, you know, we really encourage you to practice the things between sessions um, and then kind of move on quickly. It's really hard because it's 45 minutes, so um, I make sure they're like moving on to the next thing. Uh, wonderful skill for them to develop. <laughs> Great. Uh, ben, what about your groups? Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, like the other workshop homeworks, well, mm -hmm. how does that work for you? So similar to Wendy, uh, we don't require uh, homework, uh, to, to, certainly nothing to be turned into us. We really want this to be a non kind of, um, you know, assessment evaluative experience. Uh, so it's really, I think we use language like home-based practice uh, to maybe take away some of the sting and, and, the feeling of, of homework, but 
and I, I don't know how effective that is. Uh, I feel that it may be more effective, but um, yeah, they, they're given for student success series, for example, they're given worksheets um, to help them with establishing rule that both uh, balances the different demands on their time with academics, other commitments, and then also time for breaks. And we talk about like the Pomodoro method of you know, studying and they're given worksheets and handouts about that and, and several other resources. So we do encourage that for them to really get the most out of the experience, it, it, it will matter for them to put it into practice and to implement the skills and, and take advantage of some of the, the resources that, um, that we've covered. Otherwise, um, just being there uh, and, and listening and talking through it, that may not yield change for them. So really in the course of these, these meetings, emphasizing the facilitators, emphasizing how to put it into practice and, and hoping that that happens, but um, certainly we're not following up or checking in on that because it is a drop-in uh, model and, and we don't have people kind of coming back all the time. I, I do like the term you came up with, always practice, but that's what I like it. I am noticing the time um, and I'm realizing some people may be leaving and I do want to send link via chat to this feedback survey and I still don't have control over meeting. So I think I'm going to exit and come back. The panelists are co-hosts, so everybody should be able to stay in the meeting and I hope I'm just going to pop back in. Um, if I don't, maybe we can just discuss about strengths and challenges overall of offering these groups. And mm -hmm. I'll uh, Anna, do you want to send the link to one of us via email? Just because I think when you exit, the recording will stop. Oh, shoot. That's a good point. Um, Ellie, that is a great idea. Let me do that. Yeah, maybe uh, one of you can send it via chat. Sure, I can do that. Great problem solving. I'm gonna send it to all of you just in case this happens to anybody else. Um, in the meanwhile, while I'm composing this message and sending you all the link, um, Ellie, maybe you can talk about, um, let me pull up the question. Um, so your discussion groups, uh, your discussion group is on identity based, and you mentioned that one of the group leaders, is, I don't know if generally or you were speaking about last semester's trends, but in general, what's your center's philosophy regarding identity alignment of group leaders and group participants? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think in an ideal world, probably for many of us, we would love for the students to be able to see their own identities reflected in the individuals who are leading the groups for them. Uh, however, this is sometimes just very difficult due to, you know, fewer clinicians that share certain identities. So specifically, you know, trans people of color uh, being one of them. And so in this case, uh, you know, when we were planning for the group after the departure of our trans identified clinician, the center solicited someone who they believe will be trans affirming. So in this case, they approached me and, um, and, and the idea was to, for me to lead the group short term. At, at the same time, the uh, leadership of our organization worked really hard to uh, hire someone or contract with somebody that is trans identified for the long term. And so while I ran the group for two semesters, um, I'm really excited to share that we will have a trans identified clinician to take over for this semester. And uh, one thing I would just uh, say is that it can feel a little strange to lead an identity based group for an identity that you don't, you know, actually share. Um, but I, I have found that, um, you know, it was really helpful to be very transparent at the beginning of each group and, and to come out, so to speak. And so it was kind of interesting for me as a cisgender woman to come out in, you know, um, one group or other groups uh, to disclose my identity, um, you know, with other folks who are uh, trans or non-binary. So um, that was uh, kind of a, a cool clinical experience for me in, in that in that regard. And I think students appreciated it. Um, and, um, you know, we, 
definitely made some room to process. The group was very free flowing. We definitely made some room to process, you know, what was it like to, for me to acknowledge that. Um, and uh, students were, you know, very, I think, um, very happy to have hear that, uh, to have heard that disclosure. And uh, we were usually able to move on from that. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share that perspective. Elian, given this is jump-in group, does that happen in kind of every session or kind of like how, how does it come up given that you may have new students each time there? Uh, by the way, I sent the link and I, Elian, I know you volunteered to send via chat, but since I'm asking you questions, mm -hmm. Ben, you can send it via chat if you have access to it. Sure, I will. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Ellie. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it happens pretty organically. So, you know, let's say we're talking about, um, you know, initiating uh, trans-affirming care in terms of um, hormonal replacement therapy or somebody is looking for resources to purchase a binder or they're asking for recommendations on where they would, you know, find someone who um, would help to do their top surgery. So for a lot of these things, I'm happy to make re recommendations with a caveat that, you know, I'm a cisgender woman and these are uh, resources that, you know, sometimes my clients or other group members have shared with me. Um, so that's one way I'll, you know, come out. Um, and then other times, you know, we're talking about, um, for example, the experience of um, coming out to family members, um, or, you know, we're talking about the intersection of identities in terms of somebody's trans identity versus, and, and also their, um, you know, their racial identity. When we're talking about that, I will acknowledge one and then also say, um, you know, I'm, I'm a woman of color, but um, I'm, a, I'm a, a cisgender woman. And so these are the ways that that will come up. Um, I'm not necessarily prioritizing that at the, at the beginning of every group. It just happens, I think, organically in conversation. Um, yeah, so that's something that I will acknowledge. And um, as also given that students mm -hmm. may be new to the group in, uh, each time, how do you help them engage and connect? Or do you see that most of the students who come are kind of the same students? How does that work? Yeah, we definitely have several students who, you know, have committed to all the drop-in sessions, even though, um, you know, we don't explicitly ask for that. Um, some of them, you know, find that they have a sense of community, they keep on coming back. Um, in terms of for the students who are new to different sessions, I think I use a lot of skills from interpersonal, interpersonal process groups um, via Yalam. So, you know, things that you would say during the norming and, and forming stage of uh, group building um, to really facilitate connection. So, you know, for example, saying, I notice, you know, saying to a, a client, you know, notice that you're talking about this. And the student has also mentioned that, you know, maybe they're stressed about um, navigating exams or, you know, upcoming holidays while they're trying to, um, you know, uh, explore this new identity with uh, family members who are maybe not aware. Um, and, you know, how, how have other people in the group navigated similar issues and, and you know, people will share tips. And so um, I think a lot of those connection building things can be really effective for, for students. Um, and uh, one thing that I try to do, even though it's a drop-in space, is at the end of every session, I usually end the session with uh, something called Today I Heard. So it's, it's a, a, a group building exercise where students go around and they share one thing that has really resonated with them. Um, and I found that students, you know, share some really beautiful things um, during this time. So I remember one particular student, who, for example, who shared that they really resonated with the different students' experience um, of navigating their family dynamics, and, and they found that they had some hope because um, they were able to overcome something really difficult. Um, I had other students, and I remember this one student who had their camera off the entire time, who was really, you know, at the very beginning stages of kind of exploring their gender identity, um, had shared towards the end, uh, even though they were very quiet throughout the group, just um, like you can hear some tearfulness, they were expressing that, you know, I've never felt like I could just be myself in a space, even though I wasn't, I didn't have my camera on. And um, I just felt like I, being here with you made me feel a little bit closer to who I truly am. And so that was a really lovely moment. Um, and so I think those are the moments that students remember between sessions and, and they come back. Uh, so I think there's different ways that we've been able to, to keep the same folks. That's so hard for me to hear. Mm -hmm. So glad that they have that space with each other at your center. Yeah. Um, 
does it ever happen that, you know, group session starts and kind of students don't know where to start and you have to do like some sort of, you know, question or come up with a theme or do they generally just jump in? Yeah, so the other kind of like the only structured part is the closing that I mentioned. And then at the beginning, we, we do something um, called, uh, we do a version of the check-in highs and lows, but we call it shitties and kitties. Uh, it's kind of like a norm that we've developed. Um, I found that students appreciate a little bit of reverence when I'm talking with them. And so we start with that so people can check in about their highs and lows. And, and you know, people usually giggle, especially if they're first attending uh, this group. And um, that help and that thing, I think helps to loosen the, the tension, uh, especially if folks are really new to the space. And from there, we usually have a pretty free flowing group where people talk about, um, you know, whatever it is on their mind, extending from their check in. Um, students usually bring up something that, um, you know, has been challenging, for example, maybe they were misgendered on campus or, um, you know, they, they weren't sure. Um, you know, what, what was happening with um, their, you know, healthcare, for example, um, some of these experiences they'll share during their check-in will kind of naturally expand into the rest of the group. Um, thank you. That really helps to imagine like what uh, that space looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple more questions for the panel and then in about like seven-ish minutes, we'll transition to Q&A from the audience. Uh, so, um, question, um, how do you proceed if only one or two students come and um, technically you can no, no longer call it a group if it's staff you? Wendy, um, why don't you start? How, how do you handle that? Yeah, so um, when it's just one or two, um, I actually do the same thing, except when it's just one. Um, but uh, when it's say when it's two, I do the same thing that I would do in um, in an interpersonal process group, as I bring it to the clients and I say, um, how, "How do you want to proceed? Um, we have a couple of options. We could cancel for today. We could continue and go for as long as this feels." like productive, you know, we could go the entire time. Um, I find that students usually want to use that hour for what they had intended it. Um, so um, I train um, my experts to do the same and to post it to the student and say, you know, there is, if it's just one, there is nobody else. So, you know, we could continue with like the didactic piece of the group. Is that something you want or would you rather like, you know, come next week? Um, I think that only happened once last year where we only had one student and the student was very excited as a student that had come to all of the groups. And she said, no, 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 like bring it. Like I want to, I want to get the information. Um, and I think the group ended maybe five, 10 minutes early um, that week. So I have them essentially make it into a collaborative um, discussion with however many attended. Awesome. Um, well, Ellie, what about you? How do you handle that? Yeah, I think, you know, just given that the uh, trans non-binary student population is relatively small on those campuses, um, it definitely happens where we'll have groups where we'll just have one person. I don't think we've had a group where no one has shown up. So um, that's, that's good, I guess. Um, during groups where there's one person or just very few participants, what I've done is kind of similar to what Wendy has, has said, is just asking the student for you know, what their needs are. Um, I remember, for example, focusing a particular group on problem solving and really kind of connecting the student to resources. Um, I remember one topic that we had explored in detail was navigating um, some, some invalidation that they had experienced from their department in terms of the, their gender identity. So we were, you know, myself and my group co-leader really kind of dove into that. Um, and I think in that particular situation, maybe we ended a little bit early um, but I think asking the students for what their needs are and kind of taking it from there has been really helpful uh, in my experience. Thank you. And um, I'm really glad to hear that it hasn't happened that nobody came. <laughs> <laughs> but I imagine that is a uh, reality for some groups. And, and I know, but Ben, you mentioned that this had, had happened to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious, what is your policy, your center's policy or procedure regarding use of that clinical time? or how many um, sessions there needs to be when nobody shows up before you decide, you know what, like we're no longer offering this group. Ben, um, what are mm -hmm. your thoughts on this? Yeah, I know it's a difficult 
decision, I think, for a, cl a clinic, an agency, a university counseling center. Like, we obviously value our clinicians' time. And so when there aren't any attendees, um, we ask that the facilitators help out in some other way if possible, if, if there's a need. So we have like a triage or on-call system where uh, if a student is in crisis or if there's an urgent need, they can, in this case, call in. Uh, they used to walk in, now it's just call in because of COVID. Um, and so uh, all of our staff have access to see who has called and are there any folks uh, waiting to, to be um, spoken with by a mental health um, provider. And so when there are no shows um, and, and you can't have the group because no one's there, uh, we ask our facilitators to help in that way to step in and volunteer. Um, but otherwise, there isn't a kind of alternative clinical opportunity uh, for them. There's no other kind of appointment that they could ho host or, or have at that time. So uh, it's an opportunity to catch up on any notes or consult with their co-facilitator and plan for the following week, pl maybe plan for some additional outreach to spur participation in future sessions. Uh, but it is a conundrum, I think, for us. Um, that being said, even if there um, you know, are no students that show for one week or one that shows the next week, it still feels for us valuable to have these options because it's difficult to make a prediction just from one or two weeks of, of what will be the need uh, later in the semester, especially we tend to have more attendance as the semester progresses. Uh, once students might you know, become more aware of what we have available, other things in their life are maybe becoming increasingly stressful and we'll be seeking out some service like, like a drop-in group. So we feel it's important to keep, keep them and, and I don't have a recollection of us uh, canceling outright uh, are, are any of our drop-ins during the semester. So and I think it helps just with visibility, like, hey, we have these available and often students will sign up. So for example, I saw for this past Friday's uh, Make the Most of Your Time, which is the time management uh, of the student success series, there were nine students that signed up and apparently I heard from the facilitator, um, two people showed. So you get a lot of people to sign up and maybe just that act of signing up for them feels like they're doing something and, and taking initiative. Um, whether they show or not, it's another matter. Obviously they'd get the benefit if they were there, but maybe there is a benefit just knowing, hey, I've, I've taken this step, I've signed up, um, I know it's there. Maybe if I don't attend this time, there's another opportunity to, to join later. When students sign up online, I guess this may be a question for you, Ben and Ellie, do you, uh, is there a way to send reminders? Yes, yes. So we do, um, our facilitators will send out at least um, the night before the meeting, uh, we'll send out a reminder to all the students who have signed up um, so that uh, they're, they're given that heads up and hopefully that will give them just the nudge they need to, to be there. But it doesn't always work. Yeah, same. I will uh, usually send out a reminder for the group the day before. Um, and something else, um, even for the students that have signed up but then don't necessarily attend. Um, so what, with the Zoom registration, I will end up with a list of emails no matter you know, when the student signs up in the semester. And that gets kind of added into this, um, this list that I uh, keep for the semester. I'll usually BCC those students with a reminder email every week. And even if they don't attend that particular week, I have, um, have created a cloud folder um, that students can access and they can um, access resources related to, for example, gender affirming care or um, other resources in the Austin community, um, as well as uh, submit um, requests for specific resources. So somebody had requested a um, uh, you know, a, a, a book on how to um, 
how to support uh, a partner who's coming out or somebody had requested a resource on supporting, uh, or sorry, on navigating um, parent discussions. And so um, they were able to respond to my email and um, we were able to add those resources. So even, they, even though they might not be actually participating that week because of whatever reason, they're still kind of engaged uh, with our group in some other way. Oh, wow, what, what a great idea uh, to have like link to resources that's available to them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, back to the question that I asked, and this will be the last question for the panel before we jump into uh, Q&A from the audience. Wendy, uh, what is your center's policy when nobody attends the group and how you use that clinical time? Yeah, um, you know, 15 minute grace period if nobody attends sort of end the session. Um, and especially because for us as trainees, we're leading it. Um, the policy is just you use that time for um, the administrative um, tasks that you very likely have, you know, built up to this point. The group is on Fridays, um, so it's like Friday during uh, 12, 15 to 1 p.m. So I think it's a good time for, for them to, to catch up on that. Um, we've also developed um, kind of a, there's a, a weekly feedback survey um, and it's very specific to that group. So um, we're also constantly getting um, that information. So if it's ever canceled, I encourage them to use that time to go through Qualtrics and check, um, you know, the feedback and any sort of like small analysis that can be done for um, the group so far and any adjustments uh, for the next week. Um, but don't usually structure it too much. They're able to use it as they see most fit for the center. And does it uh, happen often that nobody comes for you? I hear through the grapevines that before my time, um, about once or twice a semester, there would be a group that nobody showed up to. Um, similar to what Ben, I think Ben, you were saying, um, it was at the beginning of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, so I've started making it so the group doesn't start the first week of classes, it starts the second week of classes to give it some more time um, and then kind of adjust the semester um, based on that. So we move it back um, a little bit. Thank you. Um, so this is time we'll turn it over to the audience. So as a reminder, to ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask it out loud. And um, again, I do not have control over my Zoom interface, so I am not able to see the chat, unfortunately. So if any of you have been sending me things in the chat, I'm so sorry, I can't see it. So please unmute yourself and um, ask away. What would you like to ask our panelists? I have a question. Hi, I'm Julie um, at UW Stout. I have a question when you're doing these uh, drop. I think we lost the audio. Julie, Can you hear there? me? Yes. Okay. Um, when we do a telehealth group, like an IP group, we have to know a physical location of each participant and a local contact. Do you need to, do you find you have to do that? Does system legal have you do that for drop-in groups to know where someone is physically located or no? Not for, oh, go ahead, Ellie. Oh, thanks, Ben. Um, so for us, because we are specifically indicating that um, the drop-in group is not a therapy group. Um, it doesn't have the same, um, I guess, restrictions as a traditional therapy good group would have. Um, when students sign up for, um, the, for example, in this case, the trans non-barrier group, they um, affirm a list of things on a Qualtrics form that indicates, uh, I understand this is not a therapy group and et cetera. And so for us, we are not constrained to having obtain, to, to have to obtain that um, address um, and other identifying information, which we found to be accessible for students who may not want their names connected to a group specifically about a part of their identity. Go ahead, uh, Ben. And that's, that's the same for us at UW-Madison. In addition to those, I think, advantages for us, especially this past 18 months, um, so many of our students moved from both campus, but also many out of state. And those students that were living out of state didn't have access to our traditional closed groups, our therapy groups. So these um, drop-in groups were, I think, a really important lifeline to keep them involved with our 
group programming uh, to give provide them a service regardless of their location. And I would say for us, um, it is a therapy group, but you know, there, there are notes written in the system and at the beginning of each group, um, the leaders indicate if any of you are at an address other than what's listed on your file um, in our system, like send it privately to the, um, to the group leaders. Um, and then we would document that, uh, but we kind of just trust them to indicate if it's any different than what's um, in our system. Thank you. Thank you, great question. Uh, ben, would you be able to answer the questions from Jason W in the chat? Sure, so uh, Jason asks, are any of you members of American Association of Group Psychotherapists, AGPA? And if so, what offerings have been most helpful? Um, yes, yeah, so I am a member of AGPA. Um, and Jason, are you asking offerings through AGPA or like at AGPA Connect? Okay. Uh, well, I guess just generally I've valued um, being a member of the SIG uh, for college counseling, special interest group for college counseling and getting an opportunity to network uh, with fellow um, group enthusiasts and, and group coordinators at counseling centers. And I've attended several of the um, various workshops or, or discussions. Uh, and that's been so enriching to kind of learn what other programs are doing. Um, and just being a member here right now of this panel has helped me kind of hear what Ellie's doing, what Wendy's doing. And I'm, I'm kind of taking in ideas that I hope to also incorporate at my center. So definitely encourage uh, participation with AGPA uh, and the Connect uh, experience is, is quite wonderful. I would echo that. Um, I am also a member of AGPA. Um, I uh, am a relatively new member as well of AGPA. So um, this last year was my first AGPA Connect. Um, and I would recommend every single thing that I want to. <laughs> I know that's not helpful, um, but uh, I think I focus more on training related issues this last year. So I attended a lot of the things directed to um, group coordinators um, and the, uh, the two day Institute. I very much recommend that. I think that's, it provides helpful insights, I think for not just interpersonal process groups, but in general. Um, um, I would say the, I'm gonna butcher the name, but the, um, there was a presentation on the um, brief, focus, brief group therapy. I'm, I'm butchering that, um, yeah, but- focus, uh, Yes, I think you got it. Focus, brief, group therapy. Yeah, you got it. That's, that's Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that was very helpful for me to think, particularly when it comes to counseling centers, how to make things impactful um, given a very short period of time and how important kind of the, the selling of group, we have to be a little bit of, you know, salespeople um, to get not just students, but other um, staff members to buy in. Um, I hope that's helpful, Jason. And I see Henry, your hand is raised. Would you like to ask your question? Not sure if you heard me, Henry. Uh, I think you might have to unmute yourself to ask your question. Okay. Um, maybe while Henry is navigating some of the tech stuff, um, the next question is from Nicholas. How do you manage privacy issues in telehealth group sessions? Do you have private spaces available on campus for telehealth sessions? Um, so I can go ahead with that uh, response. So at UT Austin, uh, we have actually created uh, some spaces that uh, online for their telehealth sessions. Um, students also have the ability to reserve larger rooms that us we usually use for groups. Um, for example, if they want to practice yoga in there for some of our yoga-based uh, therapy groups. And so um, that's one way that students can, can access, have better access of our services if they're living in a dorm or share a room with somebody and they don't have a private space. 
Um, so those were, uh, I think, well utilized during the pandemic. Um, and then I'll turn it over to other folks if, if y'all have other things to add. We developed within the last year a partnership with our student engagement office, and there is an, um, a space that students can um, resource by contacting us. Um, and they essentially schedule it the way they would schedule um, a session with the front desk. Um, and we, we're in the process of moving. Um, we're gonna be in a new location, but part of that is we requested a couple of rooms within our center for students to do um, telehealth sessions as well. Um, actually, I have a clarification slash follow-up question to this question uh, to Ellie and Ben. So given that, you know, your groups are drop-in and people can sign up online, do you uh, state that they have to be in the private locations? Do students already know? Is it not required that they're in a private location? How does that work? Yeah, for our students, they'll, they'll have to click agree to a series of ground rules when they do sign up through Qualtrics. And one of the stipulations or expectations is that they are in a private location. Um, and, and that might mean if they share a residence hall or dorm, that might mean asking their roommate to, to leave for that hour, hour, hour and a half. Um, that might involve wearing headphones or facing their screen away from where other kind of passersby could see to protect um, others' privacy that are involved in that session. So um, we do communicate that at the outset. Yeah, we have a same system where we'll have students affirm a list of those ground rules. Um, one of them is having a confidential space. And then do uh, students generally stick to that, do you find, or have you had issues? Uh, we've not had issues. Um, yeah, I think students are usually very respectful of the space, making sure that there's nobody else walking through or nobody else that can access or hear what's happening to discuss, discuss during the group. I'll jump in. We got um, the question. Uh, the question from Henry: um, Have you had to undertake training in organizing online group sessions? Are there helpful resources to learn more about organizing um, online group sessions? Uh, so there are uh, through our SIG. Um, we do have uh, like a list of online of trainings uh, for how to start an online group. Uh, some of them are you have to pay for, some of them are free. Uh, there's one free discussion panel that we did like when everything just moved online that's available on YouTube. Um, when I send a recording link, I'll make sure I'll send also a link to our drive that has all the resources for you all. And then we also have questions from Melissa and Josephine, which seem to be um, kind of around the same topic. Um, how do programs decide to move forward with offering drop-in groups if they continue to have a low enrollment, even if they've tried several marketing strategies? And how does the center determine when a uh, drop-in group should not be offered in a future semester because of consistently low attendance versus we should still offer it because it's important that this topic is being covered in our offerings or other reasons? Ben, do you want to take that question out? Or, I'm sorry, or Ellie, I don't know. Uh, I was going to say, I think that that happens quite a bit um, for identity-based groups um, that our center offers just because they can be very niche and, and small. Um, but it, it felt really important from a social justice perspective to continue to offer um, specifically the trans non-binary student group just because um, it's a very vulnerable population with a lot of um, challenges, particularly in, in, in the state of Texas. And so um, it, I think just the philosophy of our center is to be very affirming of different identities. Um, we didn't have to do a hard sell to our admin to be able to continue to have this group going forward. Um, although I can imagine that can maybe be difficult for other organizations. Yeah, I would say that um, it's a difficult discussion. Um, to have with the providers, in particular, if they have a real passion for offering uh, the drop-in. So we had one, I think, that was proposed called Drugs on Your Mind uh, from our substance use coordinator. Uh, it would be 
harm reduction, kind of talking about the impact of substances on students and, and their brains. And um, that had no shows like throughout the semester and it was offered on four occasions. So we opted not to renew it for last spring semester. Um, and it was piloted in, in fall of, of 2020. Um, but we're thinking of relaunching it, trying again uh, for the next uh, semester, um, just because it could have been a fluke that no one showed for those four sessions. Um, but it's, it's a low enough um, commitment, one hour per week or every month for this particular provider who has carved out coordinator time as a substance use coordinator, and this is something they wanted to do. So it feels like there's enough support to try again. But I know it can, it can depend on the demands or needs in each person's clinic. We have a few minutes left, perhaps time for one more question. Um, ben, can I ask you to resend a survey link through chat so people see mm -hmm. that? Uh, please, it's a very short survey. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, please complete it. Uh, time for one more question. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and I, I, I cannot see the chat, so I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Rhonda is asking if other counseling centers are being requested to provide in-person groups. Um, we uh, IUT Austin, we're continuing virtual groups just because of the increase in Delta variant and other variants that are popping up now. But uh, our hope is that maybe midway through the semester, some of those groups can convert to in-person. Um, at PACE, we've experienced kind of more pressure for us to be in the office, um, but not so much that all of our services be provided in person, but rather that it be uh, a choice given to the student. Um, so it's kind of to our discretion to, to do that. So all of our groups will continue to be offered um, virtually through the semester and ending how the fall goes, sort of reassess for the spring. Yeah, that is the same here in Madison. Uh, I'm at UNR and um, we have the choice whether or not to do groups in person or in Zoom. Um, we do our individual clients are mainly in person now, but groups, uh, group facilitators have the decision to choose. And we have some groups that are in person and some are in Zoom. Uh, well, the, we're at the end of the, our time. So again, please complete the feedback survey, uh, the recording. Uh, will be sent out within one to two weeks from today. Please be patient. I will send it along with a link to our SIG drive with resources. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, we appreciate you spending this time uh, and attending our program. I will ask our panelists to stay back so we can debrief. But for everybody else, please have a good week and have a good rest of your Monday. Thank you all.